So this is an extreme honor for me uh, to jump in as a moderator. Uh, it's a slight change in the program, as you could see, because Catherine could not make it. Uh, so I will rather like use this opportunity to, because we had a lot of talks and a lot of uh, panels talking about scalability and, and you know mass adoption. So I probably skip uh, this unless you really really want to talk about it. And because we have these extremely smart brains uh, 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 concentrated in one spot, uh, maybe I would use the opportunity to start by some little education because not everyone in the, in, uh, the audience is uh, um, a developer or technical person. So maybe we could uh, talk um, a bit more about privacy, uh, about the developments uh, that are happening currently around Bitcoin and what you're expecting um, in the next year or, or years to come. And maybe we can also try to explain some of the things in uh, in digestible way, for example, like, I mean, have you heard of Schnorr signatures? Would you like to know what it means, what it does? Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, I'll leave it like an open flow. Uh, I don't want to organize you, just take, uh, grab the mic, uh, um, and please uh, enlighten us on on this topic. Shall I start? Um, so the basic, the basic problem when it comes to privacy in Bitcoin is that it's a completely open and public and transparent ledger, right? So um, that's required for the system to work. All transactions are broadcast to the entire network and everyone's keeping track of everything that's happening on the, on the blockchain, basically. Um, that's, that's kind of the central problem. And then the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper suggests a solution to this problem, which is um, addresses, Bitcoin addresses are not tied to an identity, right? They're, they're pseudonymous. Um, and the, so the sort of, sort of first basic suggestion is to use a different address for, for each time you re receive a payment. Uh, but that turns out to be, doesn't really solve the problem that well for, for a, number of, a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is that the Bitcoin ecosystem still heavily relies on centralized services, um, exchanges most notably, and exchanges typically want to know who you are before you can use them. So you withdraw your Bitcoin from an exchange, you give them, their, their, you give them their, your address or one of your addresses, so now they can tie this address to your identity. Um, next time you make a payment, very often you make a payment where you use several addresses. So now they know all of these addresses are yours. This allows for clustering. Um, and if exchanges would cooperate with each other or they cooperate through like uh, analytics companies, which they often do, then they can start to map out the whole ecosystem. Um, or even uh, the other problem would be um, even network an analysis where, where they're keeping track of where uh, payments originate from and kind of assume that this IP address uh, is also the person who owns this Bitcoin address. Okay, so that's the basic problem. Bitcoin doesn't have a perfect solution for this problem. Uh, there's no perfect solution. However, there are a number of half-baked solutions. Like there are a number of solutions to uh, mitigate it a little bit. So for example, uh, a, re a, re a pretty recent idea is pay to add point where once if you're paying someone then the person you're paying actually partakes in the transaction themselves so now the money moves from your address and their address to their address um, the neat thing about this is that it breaks the assumption that all of the inputs are uh, belong to the same person so even if a small amount of Bitcoin users would, would use this, even if it's like 5%, it would already mess up the, the analytics um, heuristics that, that they're using. Um, that's one solution. There are mixing strategies, uh, Xiaomi and CoinJoin, named after uh, Mr. David Chow, uh, which uses blind signatures, which he invented, which um, allows for a trusted uh, mixing 
strategy. It's now deployed. It's actually being used in the Wasabi wallet is what it's called. Um, oh, thank you. So these are two examples. Um, I'll, I'll name one more, which is the Lightning Network uses a Tor-like uh, routing system, which, by the way, David Chaum is also uh, sort of the David founding is like father. A, uh, David is the demigod here. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> yes. Next to next to Nico, of course. Yeah. So um, the Lightning Web Network, I, I think everyone will sort of know this, but um, it's a way to route payments uh, over the network without using on-chain transactions. And the way it works, the the privacy uh, future here is that, uh, like Tor, you receive a payment from someone and you forward a payment to someone, but you don't know if the payment originated there or if there were more hops and the same goes the other way. Now, if you combine all of these sort of different tricks, you get pretty far. Uh, it may still not be perfect, but um, there are like half a dozen or, or more privacy solutions being bailed out for Bitcoin or already rolled out. And combining them all gets you pretty good level of privacy, I think. And, and I think in a couple of years from now, Bitcoin will do pretty well, even if it may not be perfect it, like for regular user, uh, users or even people who want privacy. Uh, it can do fairly well. I think I'm, I'm fairly positive on Bitcoin's privacy developments in the mid to long term. So we're to speak about anything we like. We're to speak about anything we like. Uh, of course, I mean we're to we're talking about the topic of privacy and uh, w what's going on on the level of uh, implementations and and the consequences and what what you're hopeful or what you're expecting to to come to fruition this year or in the near future. What needs to be done? Yeah, take whatever you 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 want to to start with. Well, I guess uh, for me. One of the key things that kind of brought me back into the field was when Edward Snowden, whatever you may think about him, uh, announced that the US government called what they were doing in their communications intercept as the full take. Um, That changes everything because once you know every single message on the packet switch network, then all of the uh, techniques that are based on um, the assumption that uh, no one knows is talking to him. Uh, become uh, completely ineffective. And so, for instance, I don't find it surprising that the US government has paid for the Tor network since its inception. Um, and sometimes they divide that between the State Department and the, and the military. Initially, it was paid for by the intelligence community. Uh, only, and the development of it was, from what my friends tell me. Um, so that's not really very surprising. What that means is that if you have the full take, then Tor is nothing more than a honeypot, right? It, it, you can see everything that people are trying to hide, and those people who are trying to hide their communications, isn't, reveal themselves to you. Isn't so Bitcoin such a honeypot then? Pardon? Isn't Bitcoin uh, potentially such a honeypot created by whatever, someone? I don't think Bitcoin's primary purpose is as a, a privacy mechanism. And I think those people who somehow thought it was are now finding out they have to pay uh, their taxes anyway, so are they uh, have some other trouble. That's the full take. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I said, I think that the uh, 
dominant cryptocurrencies have done an extraordinary job of providing a store of value that is secure against all adversaries so far. It's been uh, quite, quite stunning. Almost all large enterprise commercial software has been defeated, but these, these systems uh, have not. So that's, that's quite an accomplishment, and I think it shows the, that the future of secure computing is going to be one based on open source and uh, sort of standardized or, or you know, sort of very popular uh, consolidated uh, usage. Um, so uh, this is all great. It's very little to do, uh, I think, with privacy. Privacy is, uh, in some sense, an ancillary thing that is not proven to be so much of value in and of itself. There's been a lot of unclarity about what privacy really is and what it means um, and over, over the history of it and so forth. However, I think it does reflect a really powerful realization on the part of the public that somehow some kind of strong protected informational autonomy is strictly necessary for the business of democracy and, in a, and, and I think that's where the real uh, meaning and power uh, of privacy comes from and so uh, these electronic means that we've seen so far to provide privacy haven't been as effective as uh, in their deployment as, uh, as we would like. But that's, a, I believe, about to change because I think that, now I don't want to be too commercial here, but it, I, I came back to this field for a purpose and that is to push a uh, mechanism like Elixir forward and I think it can really change everything by tying payments to messaging with a very strong level of, of national laboratory level uh, security and uh, this can, in my view, create the protected sphere in which individuals can communicate with their, let's say, friends and family in a secure manner and they can pay for and be paid for valuable information, or reporting, journalism, whatever you want to call it. And through this protected sphere, they can be viable participants in democracy. And so what remains then is the connection between those digital citizens and the ability to affect control over governance. And that's something that uh, is an open question, but I've also worked on that a bit. And, uh, if you look at my charm.com, you'll see some interesting stuff in that regard. But I think that's a little out of scope uh, here. So I uh, hope that's yeah. So those are two great answers. I don't have a large amount to add to. Um, I would suggest that privacy is relative. Um, if you're using Bitcoin without having gone through an exchange, automatically. But can we afford? So in other words, um, is it is the person at risk? You know, using um, by default privacy in Bitcoin transactions and then the person needs or wants to sell the Bitcoin, right, into and needs to exit to fiat um, and then cannot provide, and maybe that's a question uh, for, uh, for uh, Gidi, because uh, then you cannot really provide a trail or you don't want to or whatever the, the situation is, right? So. Is there a risk if we implement privacy by default uh, to Bitcoin holders that eventually, you know, authorities will say, well, yeah, you can have your privacy, but uh, we want more reporting. We want this on that. 
uh, or you will be penalized uh, with uh, uh, huge taxes unless you can provide the origin of funds. Well, I believe it is. it won't be smart to base our plans based on what we expect governments to offer at the first stage and hope that that would be over there because it doesn't necessarily need a bad person to take whatever he can and to keep taking as long as he can do that because people that sit in these positions, they don't need to be bad in order to do that because they believe this is what they need to do and they try to do this the best way they can. So I think being to, to operate this under the assumption that we cannot trust anybody, like it is basically laid out, is the right thing to do. So we need to be a bit, or maybe not so little, cynical about our own human nature and to realize that this, whatever we do, it needs to be working under the assumption that it is strong, it doesn't need to have any confidence, and we are not expecting anybody to do anything out of goodwill or whatever we plan for him to do, for them to do. So basically, I think that the first thing for us to deal with is to understand that blockchain and Bitcoin, but basically now we talk about blockchain and about information, about privacy, is about using the internet. And I'm a very late immigrant to the internet world. So maybe if I came late, I can see a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have been able to observe if I've been there all, all the time. So there is a, a nice angle of somebody that's coming into the, this world, not only cryptocurrency, also internet, and to start measuring things that are going in there. So I think most people that use the internet today, and I'm not talking about the community of the blockchain, I think there we should expect it would not be such a phenomenon, they do not have a single idea about a slight idea about how exposed they are. They use this instrument, the information is out there all around, and I'm not worried about uh, getting commercials that maybe I don't want to see and pop-ups and remarketing and all this stuff. This is nothing. We're talking about full exposure, the big take, and this is a scary scene. So basically I think that the best thing that is happening with this decentralized app is like, we get to be in charge. We get to get the power back about who we are, how we are, what we do, and how to protect ourselves. So it's about identification, it's about being safe, it's about being private, this is to begin with. And this is about also, I'm not talking about education, rather the practical means of doing things in a way that is, is making us safe and private. So this is a good thing. Now I think we need to separate this from the question of would we like to have regulators or not? Because some people would like to have regulators, and I know some people believe that it's not a good thing, and maybe even there are some people that believe that they can make this happen. So a big world of big community, no governments, no needs for governments, I find this a bit too, too, too far-fetched. But if we consider this, that people can preserve privacy, and some of these people that would like to have privacy still want to be able to, to hold the government, and to make sure that the government is not too strong, not too powerful. So this is something we can implement. But I think these are like, we, we talk about these things that are big and important and we need to see the way to go there. So to begin with, we need to deal with what we have now. And I think that when we talk about the possibilities of making blockchain more private, they're good. I think they're important. I think they will make blockchain a safe place for all of us and they will intend to move forward, but then, if, as I said before, and I don't want to repeat something that is very basic in what we do, but it's still important to mention that, that I think that once we can feel comfortable with blockchain, Bitcoin, privacy, and yet be able to file and report and pay our tax due in a manner that would harm our privacy as little as can, it will intense what we do. It will enable us to get more power, more privacy, and yes, to be in alliance with uh, regulation that will enable us to move forward. And then there are wonderful things waiting for us in the mainstream, that's it. We can have the small payments, we can have smart contracts, we can do a lot of stuff, and still make our life better, private, and to scale everything up. Okay, here's the thing. In, um, I don't know how it is in Israel, but in, my, in Czech Republic, where I'm a taxpayer, 
uh, there is no such thing as presumption of innocence, right? So they, you have to prove whatever you've done uh, to the tax authority and you have to, you know, uh, plausibly uh, uh, show like, yeah, th th this came in, this, this I paid and, and uh, <coughs> basically all the books. <coughs> Do you believe, because this is a belief thing, do you believe that uh, all of a sudden the tax authorities will go, hey, sure, we trust you. It's completely private, but we trust you that what you have uh, provided in your tax no, statement think, is correct. No, my basic understanding is that, where, where is this uh, kingdom you spoke about? It's Tel Aviv, because you said they don't believe you. No, in, for example, in Czech Republic. I know, I know, I'm joking. This is yeah. also the case in Israel. I mean, okay. you shouldn't expect them to believe you. They won't. And I think they should because I love to have a system and once we spoke about this, Nick, about the US, so maybe they are tougher and maybe they are straightforward and maybe the grass of the neighbor looks better. But I love a system when you know what you need to do in order to be a good fellow and, I mean, a good fellow, and in another thing you need to do if you do that, it's wrong. So it needs to be straightforward. Now, it's not always the case. But I think that if a government is treating its citizens as if it doesn't trust them, then in Israel, of course, we get to sense that it's these small punishments for everybody, and then you don't get to earn if you're good, and you're not to, to be punished if you're bad. We didn't figure out the way to make a difference between the good and the bad. I think these systems and the blockchain will help us do that because everybody, by nature of this activity can prove whatever happened. So the basis of evidence is not conflict. We know exactly what happened. This is blockchain. And I think that once you do this properly, you don't need them to believe you because they see the facts, they can't fight you. Now let's talk about the, the interpretation of the law. Let's talk if it's a coin, let's talk if it's an asset, and let's see the ramifications. But first of all, let's see the facts. So I think in a world that we use blockchain property, properly, and I'm not talking privacy of nothing to do with blockchain, the opposite. Let's lose it in a manner that we can prove that we're doing the right thing without surrendering information that we don't need to surrender as opposed to zero knowledge proof and stuff like that. And I think all this talking about privacy on the blockchain can be used exactly for that. I mean, this is not the dream of anybody that is dealing with these kinds of things now, but bear in mind that by the end of the day, you want this to be applicable, you want this to be worldwide, you want this to be usable. This is the only way. That's what I think. You wanted to add something? No? Well, yeah, it's not the only way, but certainly a very interesting way and interesting development, so. Um, okay, so the, there's uh, one privacy implication uh, of the KYC uh, regulation, right, to, to most, uh, most Bitcoiners. I mean, I barely know a few people that never touched any exchange. Right, so on one, on one hand, we are super happy to see Coinbase onboarding 25 million people, right? But it has certain security implications for those people because Coinbase has 25 million files. 25 million taxpayers. Taxpayers, but files with their names, with their residence, and their transaction history, right? Imagine someone would hack from inside. Uh, a, a bad employee, right, would steal all those data. We have 25 million walking targets, right, for, for robberies, for extortions, and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm hopeful to see more decentralized exchanges and less of this KYC uh, thing, because KYC, in my opinion, and I would love to, to hear yours, is a blanket surveillance, right? It accounts for us being uh, criminals before we have even committed crime. Uh, and I, I personally, I don't like that. I, I would prefer, uh, you know, to be more free and whenever I screw up, they go after me and I, then I have to provide some proofs, right? Um, so we have you know, like this ecosystem that we have to live in, uh, this KYC and AML uh, uh, hanging over each, each uh, centralized service. But then we have technology that can help, right? We can educate people, hey, do not use uh, centralized services, go use some DEX, but it's very t 
difficult still to use. I don't know, have you tried uh, recently to use some of the decentralized exchanges? It, it, the process isn't there yet. It's not the, like, I want to buy Bitcoin, click and done, right? It's kind of a, you need to install, run your instance and, so uh, where do you see uh, that going, like the, the, this part of privacy? That how can we uh, make sure that people just run more into uh, privacy protecting services? Is there a way? Um, yeah, so decentralized exchanges, there are typically, typically two kind of types of these that people talk about. One of them is crypto to crypto exchange. Now that's very solvable, that's very doable. Um, you can even do a, like atomic swap kind of uh, exchanges where, where the exchange is embedded in the blockchain itself and the person you're exchanging with can cheat. That's a solvable problem and it, in, it, it's either solved already or it's being solved. That's not something I'm very worried about. The real problem is fiat to crypto, right? That's the, that's the big challenge. Um, so we have a uh, BISC is um, probably the biggest one, I th or the only one. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's definitely the biggest one. But it's hard to get right. Decentralized exchanges with fiat is hard to get right. Uh, BISC has a solution with arbitrators, and uh, it works because the arbitrators are, um, yeah, good people. <laughs> Yes, um, it's, not a, it's not a cryptographically secure way of doing it. Uh, there are sorts of failure scenarios where the arbitrators would try to cheat you, where they are themselves the counterparty in the trade and they have sort of the two out of three multi-sig and they can just seal the funds or they, can get ha uh, they could get hacked. So BISC is moving to another solution, um, which um, is basically deposit-based and the idea is to uh, take away the incentive to cheat because you would lose money. But it's still not, it's, it's clunky and it's not perfect. But I, I don't want to sound too negative about BISC, by the way. I use it myself and it works, um, so it's great. But long term, you just got to have to move to a Bitcoin economy, right? Where we don't rely on exchanges so much. That's, that's the real problem. Um, uh, one thing Nick said that, that's very true is, um, uh, if you, in that scenario, you, if, if we just use Bitcoin as money without going through these exchanges all the time, you probably have more privacy than right now um, in the banking system. But the flip side to that is, and that's, that's uh, one thing I'd like to note, is that in the current situation, we actually have far less privacy than in the banking system. So that's why it's such a big problem. At least now, if you're using a bank, you're giving away your privacy to the bank and to whichever regulator is regulating the banks. But at least in the rest of the world, you have, you have relative privacy. Uh, while in Bitcoin, because everything's open and then you have these privacy leaks, it just becomes a huge panopticon for, uh, which, which is far worse than the banking system actually. So there are examples, um, for example, if you do something that's perfectly legal in your own country, but then you travel to a country where it's not legal, what you were doing, you could actually get in trouble because you gave your privacy away to the entire world. Uh, I think there's example of, like, um, one example is uh, in the Netherlands, weed is more or less legal, and a coffee shop, so a coffee shop is a weed store, obviously. Um, a weed store, a coffee shop owner was arrested in Thailand and ended up in prison there because they figured out what his, what his occupation was. Now these kinds of things could get, could get much worse if we just give away all privacy, which is kind of uh, the worst case scenario. So I just wanted to point that out, that if we use Bitcoin right, it gives more privacy. If we use it wrong, it's horrible. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's correct. And, and as far as AML KYC goes, um, going back to my the historical uh, perspective and presentation, it's, it's also a very modern development. In fact, it's risen with digital centralization and made possible by digital centralization and blacklists. And, and uh, it is not a normal part of, of historical money. It's, it's, it's a modern obsession. And so I think people are so obsessed with it now, they can't imagine money without KYC AML, but in fact, you know, for 99.9% .9 of the history of money, there was 
there is no such thing. So. Yeah, but, I mean, what do you think, for example, what, what, when you hear identity on the blockchain? What comes to your mind? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a huge uh, privacy loss, if that. I mean, it, it's also insecure insofar as identity is a very local thing based on the relationships you have with people and based on local knowledge. And it's, um, there's a lot of utopian schemes for having a global, a global secure identity, but th those are pretty utopian as far as I can tell. Okay, but some countries are implementing these utopian dreams, such as China, uh, <laughs> already. Yeah, I'm not sure they're doing it all, all, that, all that securely, though. So, I don't know exactly like the technicalities, but it's a, it's a composition of people having these surveillance apps and the, mm. the social crediting system and, and cameras on the streets, uh, you know, scanning your face and, and basically they, they supposedly know about all your right. rights. Well, there, there probably is that trade-off in that if you're willing to sacrifice privacy to that extent, then you can have a more secure identity. Um, do you think but we'll it's, it's secure for the government, not for the people involved, I think. Do you think this, this will cook up and end up in uh, like two, two worlds? The, the, the part of the world where people decide to opt out of that uh, and just uh, leave their own rules and then the others, if you want the comfort and the, the bonus points for good behavior, you go to China? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I'm rooting for the West on, on that one. <laughs> I think w w we should maybe, without making this too heavy, look at the anti-money laundry and KYC because these are always, also became buzzwords as far as I understand because, and this is, I think, the next move for cryptocurrency and black blockchain uh, surrounding is to observe these rules because if you take and this is something that is happening right now so you take let, let's say like arenas like uh, bitstamp and others they do fiat money and they do crypto and then they get to visa themselves using the anti-money laundry regular rules and i think Aaron, what you said is very interesting because when you address the anti-money laundry rules vice versa, what can happen if you use them differently, you expose them to be really weak. I mean, it is true, they take the banks and they put them like gatekeepers, but this is the whole thing. So if you can go through the gate and convince the gate that you're okay, then this is over. Which by the way, from what I heard, it's not that an It's issue. not that easy. No, it's, it's not, not a big issue actually. Uh, that depends how much money you bring to the bank. Exactly, exactly. But this is worse than that because, no, the problem hits honest people because if you're not honest and the bank is asking you for something that is like unbelievably unconnected to anything, so if you're an honest person, you say, I don't know what to do with this. But if you are not a good person, you just give them what they want, you can forge this and you just go through. So the system is not working for the benefits of the good and it is, has a lot of restrictions. So I'm not impressed that uh, an arena that do fiat money got the anti-money laundry V because it doesn't say anything as far as I'm concerned. We should try to establish the way to use cryptocurrency anti-money laundry rules in a manner that will be sufficient, more effective and more true. And bear in mind, it doesn't have to hurt the privacy that much. But one thing we know, these are gatekeepers, it's the banks, it may be it's, uh, financial services, maybe it's lawyers and CPA, but at the end of the day, the big issue is where did the money come from, did it come from an offense? And I don't like, I don't like it when I see that, in, for instance, banks in Israel, if the money was originated from cryptocurrency, it doesn't matter how much, you can look at the blockchain and see there's nothing there, Solely because this is coming from cryptocurrency, they don't touch it. This means that the system is broken. They don't understand what they do. They don't protect the, the, the virtue of rights that they need to do. They're just playing games and covering their own ass. So the thing is, we need to move forward. We need to use these rules. We need to build new rules. We don't need to fight this because basically, these rules to begin with are aimed against drug dealers of cocaine and, uh, and arms dealers and all the horrible things and terrorists, 
We don't want this thing to happen. Maybe some people will claim we don't need to use money system to fight this. But this is what it's doing. It's not doing a very good job. We can do better if we want. I thought it's more to make sure they collect taxes on everything. No, no. <laughs> Basically, this is not what, what motivated it. At the end of the day, maybe you are right. But this is not the basic motivation in Israel. Money laundry, tax offense was not a money laundry origin uh, uh, offense till 2016. It just came late. People get confused between money laundry and taxes. It's not the same thing. Money laundry is about hiding money that came from severe offense and then you put it in the system. Actually, you're supposed to pay tax if you do that. Money laundry is about paying taxes to look legit. No, those criminalized activities in our lives are those that usually those criminals don't pay taxes on. So that's what I meant by... Uh, yes, because they never stop. They do that and then they buy false uh, expenses uh, of uh, invoices and then they clean them and they don't pay tax at all. But this is, this is the full take maybe. Well, one... Um, I was discussing this with David earlier actually, but um, one sort of aspect of information of the digital world is that um, something like privacy often has a ten tendency to become very binary like either you have it or you don't uh, you know that's sort of the a property of digital information you you have it or you don't so if you start uh, encroaching on privacy for specific reasons then it has a tendency to just creep beyond that and you lose all privacy. Um, and if I have to choose between either we all have privacy and then including money launderers have privacy or none of us, and no one has privacy, that for me, it, I, I would much rather have uh, let everyone have privacy. Um, what else? Is there a way to implement some kind of selective disclosure in the Bitcoin transactions, guys? Like I want to show that, confirm that, yeah, I indeed paid uh, on this date, or I made a transaction to this person, but not necessarily the amount. And I mean, you can totally do that, right? You can give up your addresses, but then you give up your privacy. Technically, I'm, 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 I'm the last person on this panel that should say that, but I think technically this is possible. It's a matter of policy, not technical aspects, I believe. No, I mean, providing we are talking about privacy by default in Bitcoin, um, and we will touch a, a few developments around that. I will ask gentlemen to, to be so kind and explain more uh, what is a, a dandelion and, and taproot uh, and, and you know, Schnorr signatures, so we actually understand what's possible. But the, as, as general, if we have privacy by default, uh, how can we, uh, you know, uh, approach this if I'm called and say, hey, you should uh, pr prove that you have actually paid here or received payment for tax purpose? You're giving tax me the hard part. <laughs> I think that the question whether is it by default or the other way at the end of the day, we need to decide what we want to do. And if what we want to do is to enable people to perform and then to make sure we cut, we cut the information properly and we make sure that the government gets what it needs of the fair share of what we decide as a society that this is the thing and get to protect the, the privacy, I think it will be better because right now we're talking about losing privacy. I'm not talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, which is completely transparent and people, you know, it will take a while. Some of them are already there. This is out there. You go through Coinbase or whatever, so the information is out there. So we don't have anything that we're going to lose now. I think this is something we need to understand. It's not there for us to say, okay, let's lose this. We already lost it. Basic ba basically, basically, uh, Mashtap is a cooperator with the enemy. Let me tell you something. You know, this is about geographic and timelines. You can be sitting in investigation if you are a, a soldier in Vietnam and the Viet Cong are asking you questions. This is your obligation not to talk to them. But if you sit between friends and they expect you to be honest and you lie to them, 
then you're expected to say the truth. Now, you might think that talking to a government that you elected that is protecting you from bad stuff is being a cooperative with the enemy. Somebody else might think differently, but this is not the point. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to think. Please don't tell me what to think. I'm talking about how we're going to handle our society. We want it to be fair, we want it to be honest, and I think we need a government. Now this is about putting, admitting cryptocurrency into the world. I think this is the way. Maybe there are better ways. I don't know them. So Nick, since you grabbed the mic um, and you're technically savvy, there are a few um, things happening in, in this area on the, on the uh, code layer. Um, here, Peter Moyle has implemented Schnorr signatures or has proposed Schnorr signatures. C could you please explain what it actually is, what it does, as yeah, if I, I was five? I would punt that particular one to, to core developers. Sorry? I would punt that particular question to core developers. That's not an area of my expertise. Okay. Anyone want to grab the opportunity? Maybe Aaron? Schnorr? David? Okay, so uh, his name is pronounced Peter Weile. Weile? Okay, thank you. Uh, he's, uh, he's Dutch? No, he's uh, Belgium. But or Belgium? Okay. You, okay. You know, Sorry, Peter. Same language. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so I'm not a cryptographer, but uh, Snore Signatures is a new signature algorithm that's what well, exists, and um, it's being developed for Bitcoin. Uh, it offers a bunch of uh, advantages over the current signature algorithm. Um, uh, it, it has mathematical properties that are useful. So, for example, you can combine several signatures into one signature. That pr proves um, more. Uh, yeah, you can. Okay, I just that's it. it. You can combine several signatures into one signature and then just provide one signature, and that does the trick. So, um, for example, if you have a transaction. Often it, you're, you're spending coins from different addresses, and right now you provide a signature for each address, and with Snore you just provide one signature, so that has a data efficiency uh, advantage. Uh, but there's more uh, benefits to it. For example, you can like embed some extra information into a signature, uh, which like proves something other than the signature, or, like pr provides some extra. Um, number which which you can for example use for atomic swaps where you have to like prove a n number on a different blockchain to unlock funds so this allows for uh, the, these, these trustless exchanges i mentioned earlier um and there's a um, one particularly interesting trick is a um, uh, taproot or, so the proposal they're working on now for bitcoin is going to combine snore signatures with taproot um so taproot uses another um, cool thing which is called MAST and MAST is a smart contract solution essentially where um, you can make conditional payments so for example Lightning uses this a lot and there's other applications for it so for example you can create a transaction that or you can lock funds up and you say okay this can be spent in a number of ways so one way we can spend is for example both of us have to sign the transaction. Uh, if we both agree on this transaction, like we're moving the funds to this address, we both provide our signature and it goes to this new address. Or maybe you get hit by a bus and then next week and I can spend it on my own. So we set the date to uh, January 15th. On that date, it just needs my signature. So now there's two ways to spend the money. It's called mass and you can make another arbitrary number of, uh, of, of, of conditions there. Now, um, with MAST, you do a clever thing with Merkle trees where um, you only reveal whatever, whatever you're using. So right now we can already do this, but then we have to reveal all the ways which we could have used to spend the money. So now everyone, even if I wait a week and I do it on my own, they still learn that I was actually sharing the money with you and the, these were all of the options. Um, with MAST, you actually, uh, I only reveal my transaction, I only reveal the one in a week from now, and then they'll never learn you had anything to do with it. And now with Snore, you can make it even cooler, we can turn it into a transaction that looks normal. Uh, I should note, if you don't get hit by a bus, 
we can turn it into a transaction that looks normal. So now people won't even learn that it was a two out of two multisig, it was just a normal transaction. That's how everyone sees it. So you can create all sorts of cool smart contracts and then as long as no one gets hit by a bus or no one tries to cheat or anything like that, which is the case 99% of the time, it looks like a regular transaction. So that offers a lot of privacy. Uh, so for example, you can create lightning opening and closing transactions that look like regular transactions. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, it offers privacy, it offers efficiency, it, uh, it's, a, it's a cool thing upcoming. David, so how would you compare Elixir's privacy with what we just heard? Do you use any of those developments? Is everything that you develop uh, uh, in Elixir yours? Well, uh, Edward Snowden also, I think, remarked once, at least that's what I read, that uh, Monero uh, was written by amateur cryptographers. Um, so when I look at the privacy mechanisms proposed and available in other uh, Blockchains, it's a uh, pity to have to say what I think. It's a what? A pity to have to say what I think about them. However, um, let me... Uh, sorry to put you in the situation then. <laughs> uh, maybe I could take the conversation to a, a higher level. I mean... Uh, most people in the space, I find, aren't aware of the fundamental results which we spent a lot of effort uh, trying to prove and actually it was a, a great thrill to uh, break through, a, a find a new uh, result in science that had been unanticipated and to be able to prove it, it and so I'm referring to the multi-party computation work and let me just try to convey here briefly the essence of it without getting into the, the details which I will be happy to speak about tomorrow uh, at, um, at Technion, yeah, so that's in the morning I think. Um, if you're interested, but um, imagine like a simple analogy, a lot of, uh, of children are uh, having complete trust in let's say a grandparent. And so each of the children can go and meet with the grandparent and tell the grandparent all their secrets and learn information from the grandparent. Now they all trust this grandparent completely. Well, it turns out that it is a theorem. In other words, it's a scientific fact that we've been able to prove mathematically, rigorously, that so long as each child has a secure uh, opportunity to meet with the grandparent and the grandparent um, is honest and does not leak information, then in some sense you can solve any information security problem that you can imagine. This is like the church touring thesis for information security. It's not that surprising. But what is surprising and what we were able to prove is that you don't need the grandparent to achieve exactly the same result if you can meet certain criteria. For instance, if you have public key cryptography or alternatively, if you have a majority of the participants being honest. So in either of those cases, just the ability for the children to communicate among themselves obviates the need for this mutually trusted party and allows all the same things to be done. So, why am I talking about this? What does this mean here? It, in this context, it just means that it's certainly possible using cryptography to 
make sure that the tax people are paid appropriately and that the bad things aren't like allowed to uh, benefit people within the system or whatever uh, protections you want and no additional information about what anyone is doing uh, in terms of, of payments, um, making and receiving payments and so forth uh, need be revealed to any other party. So that's a theorem. We know that it's possible to do that. So the only question that remains is, uh, from a technical point of view, is it, are there practical protocols that allow us to do this efficiently and under what cryptographic is Yes. Such a I profound like thought the the, brought the down the house. <laughs> <laughs> this is the killer app. This is the killer app. Check, check. Ah, here yeah, we're back. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to kind of connect the, the dots of uh, uh, Aaron talking about smart contracts actually providing some benefits uh, to, to privacy and here we have the smart contract expert, but everyone please, um, what, what do you think is the uh, top three or five uh, best use cases? for smart contracts and what do you, where do you see the technology taking off the most? Um, well, so the, the low hanging fruit are financial contracts that can be fairly objectively defined. Um, so a couple of things I'm working on, uh, one of them is smart contracts for financially sophisticated non-programmers. So for example, people who understand what a butterfly spread is a combination of two options but they don't know how to program, you know, Solidity or, or you know, a, a programming language. And so um, bringing more of the contract part to smart contracts, basically. Um, and uh, there's, of course, tons of contracts. You can't do that. They have a lot of subjectivity to them. But the low-hanging fruit are things like financial contracts. And, and instead of enforcing them in a court of law, you incentivize them through proper collateralization and and the uh, trust minimized um, running of it. So, um, and then another, another thing that we've been working on are uh, what I call secure cash flows. So you get pools of money, and these pools of money, and this requires a Turing complete um, system, um, has a certain distribution that you go through. Everybody's entitled to, say, certain dividends on a stock or coupons on a bond. And right now that is routed through a bunch of banks in a very um, kind of politically risky and hazardous way around the world. And um, this, this would trust to minimize the cash flow from the originator of the dividend or the coupon bond to the people getting it. And once it's in that pool, it's very trust minimized. You can't, it's, it's censorship resistant also. Nick, uh, there's a little bit of a debate um, kind of between Bitcoin and Ethereum where sort of Bitcoin developers uh, see blockchains as systems that validate more than anything else. And MAST would be an example of that, mm -hmm. where all of the conditions kind of happen behind the screens and only kind of the winning or the, the, the end result is, is published on the blockchain and that's what mm -hmm. everyone uh, validates. Well, the Ethereum perspective is they want to uh, do the computation itself on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. What's your well, perspective Well, I mean, for there? the vast majority of business logic, there isn't any efficiency difference between verifying and computing. I mean, there's NP-complete problems where there is a big difference, but th th those are, I think, a very small minority um, of what needs to happen. So if you have that one of those NP-complete problems, um, the, well, what the are approach these? you're talking about can, can work. I don't know what NP-complete, maybe I'm the only uh, one. I the mean, world, it's just uh, something that's much easier to verify than, uh, I mean, for example, digital signature is not necessarily MP complete, but it's much easier to verify than it is to 
um, create, yeah. So um, that's an example if you wanted to do that kind of computation in a smart contract, it would be ridiculously slow in that case, but um, if you wanted to do that, then you would benefit from, from separating verification and performance. But I think in the vast majority of, of cases where you just have business logic, it doesn't really help. David, Vivi, any ideas for smart contracts? We're being kicked out slowly, right? Slowly. Yeah. Just keep the electricity on, even if you don't like my answer, people. No, I, I think that to, to make it very short, I think for what, for what I feel, and I'm, I'm especially not an expert, I think that what I find strong with the Bitcoin blockchain, that it is very simple, straightforward, verifying stuff. And when you look at the small payments of the Lightning, it's also very simple and it's working. So this is one thing I tend to prefer. Now, if you go for Ethereum, which is more complicated, you're not complete and you can do other stuff. I would be happy if it's possible to do this in a manner. Again, we go back to the same things that bothers me. I think if rules, first, Nick, when I read your, when you read your studies, I say, when you said, I would like people to be able to do business in the cyberspace. This is why I want them to have contracts to perform. So I think in terms of relationship w with us, vis-a-vis -vis governments or whatever, we can make it simple, we can make it clear, and we can make sure that it is determined upfront what needs to be done, and once we did it, it's okay. We don't need to, this is the next step. We, should, we did our duties, now leave us alone if it can be working and it's immutable and it will serve the relationship of what we need to take. Because once you tell, once you decide what you give, on the same time you decide what you don't give. So this is one way of protecting ourselves from the big take. It's the same side of the coin, different side of the same coin. That's my opinion. Aaron, are you excited about smart contracts at all? Sure, but um, smart contracts uh, smart contracts are everywhere already. I mean, Lightning works by smart contracts and any multi-sig is smart contract. Any, any regular transaction even is arguably a smart contract. So uh, in that sense, sure. Okay, because they're, they're trying to end this, maybe a final one sentence on, you know, your outlook on 2019 and what you're excited about. And we'll finish that. 19. 19. What? Outlook for 2019, right? Yes. <laughs> what did I say? 18. Okay. Uh, do you want to start? <laughs> I don't know my answer yet. Well, I mean, roughly speaking, every year more and more people are getting um, screwed over, for lack of a better term, by the, by the, the mainstream financial system um, because of the radical experiment it's running. Um, and the ease of political control. And so sort of the big places of growth in the next year are going to be whoever is getting excluded from the mainstream financial system. I hope this is going to be working because, I mean, there's so many flaws in these systems. We need to find a way to do this properly so it would be working. So we can defer of the way, but I think Everybody here, and I guess most people, except the people that is working against them, would like this to happen. And I, I would like finally to, to, to take the time to thank you people for coming over because we really appreciate this. We are all like in a dream. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you as well. Thanks everyone for coming. Okay, I, I, actually, I would actually just like to say a few things to add to s some of the things that you said. Um, the China credit system, it's, it's actually crazy because you know if I would transfer you money and you have a lower credit than mine then you know my credit would go lower if I buy alcohol every day or every week at the grocery store then my credit would go would go would go low um, but the interesting thing is that it's the same thing that's happening here we're using Facebook we're using Google I mean they're just there they just have a different name to this but it's still a some sort of a social credit system um, and I'm not yes, saying but about but you, d you don't rely in your real life uh, whether you can buy a ticket to a train on uh, your Facebook uh, posts. Yet. 
Yes. Not yet. Yes. No. <laughs> um, yeah, you were talking about money laundering and it's, uh, um, you know, drugs and weapons. And then, you know, the biggest sellers of, of weapons is the United States. And the biggest sellers of, of drugs is also like big pharma. And number <laughs> one channel to launder money is still the banking system, but it just comes naturally with e the uh, exactly. amount of... And, um, yeah, uh, Edward Snowden, I think he's, uh, if you haven't seen the documentary about him, you, you should see it. It's a guy who decided to give up his life uh, because he thought this is a worthy cause. Um, and yeah, I believe that we have about five years to kind of manage our privacy, uh, or five to ten years to get our privacy back in our own hands, or, I don't know, we're in the hands of like the Googles and Facebooks and Chinese governments. Um, and aside from that, uh, thank you, Bitax, for hosting such an incredible conference. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, David. Thank you, Giddy. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Elena. Uh, one more plug. Uh, Sunday, uh, 7 p.m., there's a Bitcoin Association. They do uh, uh, meetups. Yes. So are you coming? Because I'm going to be there so we can talk. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's it. You're allowed to go home. <laughs>